Some people say music is plain entertainment. Some people say musicians should only worry about making people dance and dream. Today, we're talking about Zombie by Fela Kuti. Satirical lyrics, infectious music, forceful denunciation of blind obedience. Fela Kuti delivered music that makes you think while you party, that makes you hope while you lay beaten, that looks at the past while pointing at the future. Zombie gained a place in the history of music by pissing off the Nigeria government and military to no end. Wait, that's no good. Why did Zombie enrage the Nigerian ruling classes so much? Was it that bad? Why didn't Mr. Kuti simply sing some good old love songs? Let's discover all about Zombie in this episode of... If music could... Lagos, Nigeria, 18th of February 1977. A different kind of day welcomed the inhabitants of the Kalakuta Republic. Armed soldiers were gathering, a thousand of them, all around the electrified fences protecting the block of buildings of the self-proclaimed independent republic. Kalakuta was the home of Felakuti, the most famous musician in Nigeria. It also hosts his band, their families, some friends, a free health clinic, and a recording studio. Inside the complex, people realized that there was nothing to do. They were trapped. Outside the complex, civilians had started gathering too. 60,000 of them. They knew this was not like the dozen other raids on the premises. Something significant was about to happen. It was like a big theater show. People staring on the highway. Cars couldn't move. The army had to order the electrical authority to switch the light off in the area. The shot time took them three hours, you know. So people could really see that I was being attacked without attacking anybody. When the electricity was off, the army started getting in. The official excuse was a drug bust. But the moment they stepped in, the soldiers started attacking whoever was inside. Fracturing bones, destroying property, a fire broke out, engulfing several buildings. Felakuti was almost beaten to death. His mother, 77, was thrown out of a second floor window. Why so much violence? Who had ordered it? Easy that, it was General Obasanjo's order. Obasanjo, the head of the military junta ruling over Nigeria. Hello, Topatters. This is Simon Mas, a guy trying to cover black culture without being a white prick about it. Will I manage? Unless you've skipped the introduction, you know the answer to the other question too. The army attacked Kalakuta in retaliation for Felakuti's work. Zombie, his latest album, had mocked your average soldier and his blind obedience, but that was only the last drop. Kuti had a long history of brushing against the Nigerian elites, one going much further back than Zombie. In fact, it stretched from before Fela's birth. Olufela Olusegan Olutudan Ransom Kuti was born in 1938 in southwestern Nigeria, the land of Yoruba, the first Nigerian population who had access to Western schools, a population used to getting involved in politics despite living in a colony. Fela's grandfather, Josiah, was one of the first black Anglican priests in the area. He was also the first black Nigerian to record a music album, a collection of Yoruba and Christian hymns. Josiah converted people through the power of music and acted like a mediator between his people and the British colonizers. One generation later, the Ransom Kutis were even more active in the political arena. 
Pelas' father, Israel, was a priest too, and an educator, and the head of the Nigerian Union of Teachers. Israel was a strict father. He believed in discipline and activism to make things better, outside and inside his house. Israel used his influence to turn Nigerians onto the values of plurality, to defuse the mounting ethnic divisions exploited by the British to keep them in check. Fulmilayo, Fela's mother, was an even more prominent figure, first female student at the prestigious Abe Okuta Grammar School, first Nigerian woman to ride in a car, first head of the Nigerian Women's Union, first woman recognized as a leader on a national level. Fun Milayo met Mao Zedong and other communist leaders traveling in Europe and Asia. This was no average family, and Fela was no average kid. Ever since he was little, he resented authority. His family life was too strict and too perfectionist. The natural extension of the rigor he would find at school. Fela stubbornly got in trouble for defining his parents' and teachers' wishes. As a kid, Fela learned Western classical music, trumpet, and traditional and contemporary Yoruba music, drums. He discovered the lively Ghanaian high lifestyle based on jazz and traditional Ghanaian rhythms, the rumba and the mambo scene, the Lagos happy-go-lucky nightlife crowd, in 1958, Israel Kuti died of cancer. Fela moved to London. His mother wanted him to study medicine. Fela enrolled at the Trinity College of Music instead. It was in England that I started to feel the awareness of how to be an African. I started to feel, oh wow, so these white people don't like us too much. At that time, you read the newspaper in England, House for Rent, no coloreds, no dogs. It annoyed me a lot. At Trinity, Kuti furthered his knowledge of classical music. For the stage, though, he chose something else. Around London, one could find all kinds of music. Blues, jazz, rumba, calypso, mambo, high life. Fela started a band, the Kula Lobitos. He wanted to study the African origins of jazz, but he ended up mixing genres together. The bass was jazz and high life. Then he added salsa. Then rhythm and blues. Soul was the last ingredient. Kula Lobitos became a staple of London clubs specialized in African music. In 1963, Kuti returned to Lagos. A new incarnation of Kula Lobitos took the stage. This time, Fela tried to focus only on his beloved jazz. It didn't go well. His mother urged him to play music that people could relate to, less jazz-oriented. In 1969, Kuti and his band moved to Los Angeles, a chance to earn more money while taking the music one step forward. In LA, Kuti met a Sandra Isadore, and through her, the civil rights movement the Nation of Islam, the Black Panther Party, the writings of Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X. Fela reconsidered his history and background. Everything clicked. He abandoned the love songs for politically charged reflections on African culture and colonialism. In the early 1970s, Kuti returned to Lagos once again he rebranded his band Africa 70. His sound was more rounded up, richer, adding funk and traditional Yoruba elements to the mix. Afrobeat was born. From then on, Fela Kuti was a thorn in the side of the local elites. He relentlessly questioned and mocked the colonial mentality of his people. Their desire to act European, their attitude and pretenses, the corruption and inefficiency of the government. Albums like Why Black Men They Suffer, Gentlemen, and Expensive <coughs> Shit turned Fela into Nigeria's public enemy number one. The authorities arrested Kuti time and again, 
on bloated or drummed up charges, and every time Fela's public stature grew. He became known throughout Africa as a hero for the common people, and as an enemy for the ruling classes. And so, on that morning, on the 18th of February 1977, the stage was set. It looked like the final showdown between Kuti and the establishment. A thousand soldiers breaking into the Kalakuta Republic, all because of Fela's last album, Zombie. What made it different? Why did this album trigger such violence? Time to do what people rarely do when talking about Fela Kuti's music. Let's talk about the music! With Africa 70, Kuti borrowed the mix of spiritual and satirical elements typical of Gelede ceremonies. These were carnival-like traditional events that Fela attended when he was a kid. It was party music, designed to dance. Rhythm was king here. Lyrics are often delivered with a call and response component. This allows and encourages the public to take part in the performance. Kuti's albums comprise two, maximum three tracks. His songs start with the groove, followed by instrumental thematic statements and solos. The voices surfaced only well into the song. Zombie is no exception. The title track starts with interlocking melodies played by two guitars. In fact, the initial four-bit bar at the beginning of the song is the whole guitar part, repeated for 12 minutes. This conveys the rhythm foundation of the piece. Everything else is built on top of that. Very soon, congas and bass come in. Thanks to its being more melodically free than the guitars, the bass sounds like a deep voice. Then, it's time for drums and other percussions. And a sax, with the statement of the song theme and a solo section. Other horns join in. The energy rises, and then it stops dead. And then it starts again. The stereotype is that African music is loosely structured. It's all about improvisation. Well, not here. There is improvisation, of course, but one has to appreciate how well-rounded the song structure is. The stop-and-goes repeated throughout the song are not arrangement tricks. They don't just serve to build anticipation and release. They build a bridge between the music and the lyrics that are still to come. To my knowledge, there is only one way to have such a tight performance. Planning and rehearsing until perfection. Africa 70 used to have at least three public rehearsals per week in the Kalakuta Republic, on top of the paid public performances, that is. When the lyrics hit, we discovered what pissed off the military so much. Soldiers are mocked as zombies, creatures so dumb they don't do anything unless ordered. And they do whatever they are ordered to. Walk, kill, die, get sense. Kuti says zombie way is one way. A soldier's life is just obeying orders like he's some kind of object. In fact, you can put him in reverse like you would with a car. But when you're driving a car in reverse, you're in the car and you pay attention to its safety. You could get hurt. If you're a general who puts a zombie soldier in reverse, you don't care what happens, it's the zombie who can get hurt. You're safe. The stop and goes in the music, then, are a foreshadowing of a zombie's life. Turn it on. Make it obey whatever order. Turn it off. Forget about it. And it's all pumping through your stereo. I dare you to listen to the song Standing Still. You can't. Now, this political jab might not mean much to us. We say all sorts about the government, police, the military, and they don't care. Which says something about our democracies, maybe? Kuti had spared no punches when criticizing the colonial mindset of Nigerians and Africans in general. But now, it was different. In Nigeria, 
the military was the base of political life. Consider this. In the 39 years between its independence and the start of its Fourth Republic in 1999, Nigeria has been ruled by military juntas for 28 years and 334 days. And in 1999, good old General Obasanjo was elected head of state. Another eight years. Recording an album mocking the military this way was huge in Nigeria. It's like playing the Soviet anthem at the Trump rally. Imagine what would happen if you did that. Such was the irreverence of Kuti's statement. What was worse was that zombie sold very well. People could make a statement on their own. You can't protest the regime in the street. Well, you can buy a harmless, if controversial, vinyl. The second side of the album is the equally infectious Mr. Follow Follow. If anything, Kuti seems to charge his message even more. The military might be what it is, but if you blindly follow other people, you're not different. The rhythm is more relaxed, the music a bit more hypnotic, but the message is clear, sung as usual in pidgin English so that people throughout Africa could understand. There's a call for unity. The same pan-Africanism Fela's grandfather and father wanted. A unity to get rid of colonial influences, military mindset, unquestioned acceptance of the status quo. A unity to change course, to rebuild the continent on the roots of African culture, on common sense, on equality. This couldn't be accepted by the powers that be. Well, it was all over in a few hours. The Kalakuta Republic raised to the ground. The buildings burnt down. The health clinic smashed. The studio destroyed with all the masters of Kuti's previous records and the band's instruments. People dispersed or arrested, broken in body and spirit. This was political retribution, military coup style. Funmilayo, Fela's mother, thrown out of a second floor window, was brought to the hospital. She soon lapsed into a coma. She never woke up. She died more than a year later, on the 13th of April 1978. The same newspapers reviling her son published tear-jerking eulogies. Crocodile tears. That year, Fela and Africa 70 gave a performance of Zombie in Accra. A riot broke out and Kuti was forever banned from entering Ghana. And the band couldn't perform back home. The authorities had closed the nightclub at the Empire Hotel where they gigged regularly. That message was clear too. Everything seemed lost. At 11th Tower, Fela Kuti received an offer to appear at a Berlin Jazz Festival for a fee of $80,000. That's about $363,000 in today's money. Very serious money for one performance, Fela accepted, bringing 70 people along with him. This was not just an extravaganza. Those were people too close to him to be left behind in Lagos. The government would have taken care of them in some way or another. That's also the reason why Fela married 27 women in 1978. Free love? Ah, musicians. Nah. Many of them were Kuti's associates and workers. The Yoruba tradition, Fela maintained, said that it was a man's duty to protect women from violence by marrying them. And so, he had done. It also helped to shelter him from drummed-up charges of kidnapping women. Velakuti went on with his career and with music that didn't hold punches. He was subjected to further harassment from the authorities, democratically elected or not. His output eventually stopped in the 1990s. In 1997, he died. Fela, an AIDS denialist, who denounced the disease as a white man invention, had died of AIDS. 
If music could talk, it might say. Tristeza now tempfin. Felicidade. Sim. If you like zombie, the easy first step is to listen to other Fela Kuti's albums. My favorite is Before I Jump Like Monkey, Give Me Banana. You want a white take on zombie? Try Remain in Light by Talking Heads. Definitely worth your attention. Curious about Ghana in this high life genre? It's hard to find a lot of those albums these days. I chose Ghana Special Modern High Life, Afro Sounds and Ghanaian Blues, 1968 to 81. A nice compilation to start delving in. How about some of Kuti's influences? There it is, it's a solid James Brown work from the 1970s that you might like. On the jazz side, given Fela's love for John Coltrane, you've got to check out A Love Supreme. It inspired countless musicians from every genre. And for a different kind of West African fusion, Mia Funke by Ali Farka Toure. Having said that, it's time to close shop. Keep your top hat on until we next meet. I found out about Zombie while researching this series. The title track started and I was like, this is remaining light. Wrong. Kuti made me ponder what a hero is. The man had his shortcomings. One can't deny it. And still, he stood for the poorest people in his community. He kept living in the same rundown and dangerous neighborhood, even when he could have moved anywhere else. He attacked dictators, politicians and corporations with music that made people party, laugh and feel good. Maybe a hero is a good example. When we feel we're just little people, when change seems impossible, when we're about to give up, we should think back to Fela Kuti and do our best with a smile. What about you? What's your story with Zombie? Tell me with a comment. Simon Mas, music you love.